Hi, my name is Ashley and I'm a mom of two little girls. I have a four-year-old named Kylie and I also have a two-year-old named Mia. Now, if you are a Montessori parent like myself, I am very willing to bet that you have come across this term, respectful parenting, at least once or twice, maybe more than that, in your parenting journey thus far. And if you have not, that's okay, because that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about in today's video, so you'll know everything you need to know by the time we're done. But it is an approach that I am equally as passionate about as I am Montessori. And I know that many of you are also interested in learning more about it, because I've seen you say so as much in the comments on a lot of my videos. So I wanna get right to it. I've got a ton of information to share. So from one busy parent to another, let's take a look at how Montessori and Rye or respectful parenting intersect in your Montessori home. Okay, so let's start off with a quick little background and disclaimer. So my familiarity with respectful parenting, otherwise known as Rye, which stands for Resources for Infant Educators, actually began a couple of years ago when my first daughter was about eight, nine months old, kind of when I started seeing the verge of toddlerhood on the horizon. I came across Janet Lansbury's website, who is a Rye associate, and I started listening to her podcast on Ruffled, which if you have not heard, it's amazing. I would highly recommend it. I started reading her books and her blog articles, basically anything I could get my hands on to learn more about this idea of respectful parenting. But over the last couple of years, as I have learned more and more about Montessori, I have really come to see how the two approaches really dovetail quite nicely with one another. And I knew that I wanted to take my own understanding of respectful parenting to a much deeper level. So I decided to enroll in the Rye Foundations course, which is a 12 week intensive training. It's actually called Rye Foundations Theory and Observation. It is a course that is offered by the Rye organization itself, and it's their very first step on their own pathway to certifying their Rye associates. And so I was really excited to be able to actually learn about it, you know, from the source itself. So I just recently completed the course a couple of weeks ago and it was such an incredible experience. I am so thankful that I had the opportunity to be able to take the course in the first place. Would definitely recommend to anybody who has the time and the resources and the drive to want to dive a lot deeper into Rye and Respectful Parenting. Um, but here's the disclaimer, just because I completed the course does not certify me as a full-on Rye associate. So the things that I'm about to share with you in the video today are not officially on behalf of the Rye organization. I'm not trained to train anyone else about Rye. I am merely sharing with you my personal takeaways, the things that I have learned about Rye, respectful parenting, and especially how it applies in a Montessori home, because that is how I am applying it in my own home environment. Now, before I go into all of the similarities and differences between Montessori and Rye, which is the point of this video, I do want to give you just some of the basics on Rye so that we're all caught up and kind of on the same page here to start out. Now, if you don't know anything about Montessori either, then I would highly suggest going down into the description box after this video is over and watch my Montessori basics video because that will give you everything you need to know to get started with learning more about the Montessori approach. But here we're focusing on Montessori and Rye and kind of how they intersect with one another. So if you're wondering a little bit more about what Rye is before we get started, then here's what you need to know. So Rye stands for Resources for Infant Educators. It was an approach that was started back in 1978 by a woman named Magda Gerber. And she actually brought all of her knowledge and experience with her to the United States as an immigrant from Hungary, where she was working alongside Dr. Emmy Pickler, who is a Hungarian pediatrician and the foremother, if you will, of this entire approach. Sometimes you will also hear Rye referred to as the educaring approach, which is based on a term coined by Magda Gerber. It's the combination of the words educator and carer, so educarer, and she coined that term to describe somebody who educates children in a caring way. Now the Rye approach really focuses on the care of infants and toddlers specifically, but the principles are very much applicable to older children as well as teenagers and even adults really. Um, but there are a couple of basic principles that are involved in this approach that are kind of always at the forefront of the educator's mind when they are interacting and caring for a child. So the first one is respect. I'm actually looking at the list of the principles right here in front of me because I wanna make sure I don't miss one by accident. But respect is like the number one biggest one. 
as well as authenticity, trusting basic trust in the infant's confidence, as well as sensitive observation, and involving the child in all of their caregiving routines, a safe, challenging, and predictable environment for the child, making sure that you give them time for uninterrupted play, having freedom to explore, as well as consistency. And we're gonna talk about each of these in my description here of the similarities and differences between Rye and Montessori. All right, so let's start off by talking about all of the similarities between the two approaches, because I think you will find, as I have, that there is a lot of overlap, especially in the basic ideology of the two philosophies that helps them to really naturally complement one another. So the first one is basic trust in the child's competence. Both Montessori and Rye are very child-centered approaches where the child is viewed as a self-initiator, an explorer, a discoverer, and the adult is encouraged to follow the child's lead, to follow their interests, and to constantly be observing, looking for signs of the child's readiness and to be ready to respond to those cues but also to ultimately respect the child's unique timeline of development. So they're not being rushed along to the next thing. They're not worrying about developmental milestones. They're just allowing the child to develop according to his or her own natural timeline and to just let it be for what it is. And then in both Montessori and Rye, because there is this basic trust in the child's competence, there is also this tendency to foster their independence, not as a means of making them grow up any faster or trying to turn them into little adults, nothing like that, but more so as a response to the child's showing us signs of being ready for that independence and respecting them enough to give them that freedom. Which brings me to my next similarity between Montessori and Rye, and that is a deep respect for the child as a whole person. So in both approaches, we are trying to actively establish mutual respect between the adult and the child, no matter how young they are. We reject the notion of authoritarian discipline where you know the adult is the authority figure and the child must obey without any rhyme or reason. Instead, we're encouraging collaboration between the adult and the child while also maintaining age appropriate limits for the safety and the sanity of all parties involved. And so in cultivating this kind of mutual respect between yourself and a child comes this notion of authenticity, which is exactly Exactly what it sounds like. It is being authentic, being true to yourself and also allowing your child to be their true authentic selves. So for you, that might look like being really open and honest with yourself about your own feelings and knowing what your own limits are and being able to communicate those in a respectful way to your child in a way that you would want someone to communicate those things to you. So just for an example, let's say you're in a really bad mood on a particular day because it happens to all of us. And instead of taking it out on your child and being short with them, instead maybe just taking a step back, you know, taking a breath and telling your child very upfront, I'm feeling really grumpy today and I'm really sorry that I shouted at you. I shouldn't have done that. I need to take a few minutes to cool off and then we can talk about this when we're both ready. Now on the flip side of that, allowing your child to be their full authentic selves is not only respecting who they are and appreciating them for all of their little quirks and things like that, you know, respecting their timeline of development, but also accepting and acknowledging all of their feelings, whether or not they are feelings that you agree with. So this means not trying to shush or quiet a crying child, whether that be by telling them they're okay or bouncing them all over the place or putting a pacifier in their mouth. You're not trying to quiet their communication to you of their feelings because children communicate by crying. You're accepting those feelings for what they are and you're allowing them to process it in whatever way that they need to. And as they're doing that, you are observing. You're trying to figure out exactly what the source of your child crying is and trying to figure out a way to help meet that need so that you can actually get to the root of the problem instead of just stopping the symptoms. And I always think it really helps to put the shoe on the other foot to see it from our child's perspective. So if you imagine just briefly, if you had a really rough day at work and you came home and wanted to share about it with your partner and you were really upset, maybe you started crying about it, 
If your partner's response to you was to start shushing you or to stick a pacifier in your mouth or to give you a snack or something or just to tell you, oh, you're fine, stop worrying about it, you probably would not be very happy with that kind of a response from your partner. That doesn't feel very empathetic. You want them to allow you to express yourself and to just listen and to maybe help you brainstorm and problem solve, but not to just dismiss your feelings. And that's how our children feel. So if we can remember that, then we are in a much better position to allow our children to be authentic with us. So the next similarity between Montessori and Rye is an emphasis on natural motor development. We are respecting our child's natural timeline of development. We are not pushing them to achieve the next motor milestone, you know, whether it be rolling over or sitting up or crawling or standing and walking, what have you. We're not constantly pushing them and trying to help them in some way to reach the next milestone. We are simply letting them be, allowing them to practice in whatever stage they are as much as they need to, to help themselves get to the next milestone when they're ready. So in neither of the approaches will you find that an adult is helping a baby to roll over or propping them up with a bunch of pillows so that they can sit up long before they're actually capable of holding themselves up in a sitting upright position by themselves. They are not helping them to crawl, like in a futile attempt, holding underneath their belly and trying to suspend them up on their hands and knees before they're able to hold their weight in that position. They're not holding them by their fingers and helping them to walk along that way before they are capable of doing that by themselves. All they're doing is allowing their child freedom of movement. They're giving them as many opportunities as possible to practice all of those little smaller movements and positions that come in between the big ones that we normally think of that help actually prep them for those bigger milestones. And because we want to provide them with that freedom of movement, we're not placing them into baby holding devices. So like exercise, saucers, walkers, swings, bouncers, jumperoos, bumbo seats, high chairs, you know, all the manners of devices that we have invented to help hold babies for what we think is their safety. We're instead just getting rid of all of those things and putting them on the floor and allowing them to stretch and move as much as they need to. The next similarity, and it's a really big one, is observation. Observation is huge in both Montessori and Rye for a very good reason. Dr. Montessori came up with the entire Montessori method through her own observations of the children in her care. She was able to figure out the things that she did about child development and about what they needed and what they responded to by observing them, passively observing, might I add. So she wasn't interfering in any way. She was just taking a step back and just watching like a fly on the wall and taking copious notes the entire time and then thinking about it later and coming up with all of the conclusions that she did. And the same goes for Magda Gerber's approach. She encourages parents and caregivers to observe their child, to just take a step back and to wait, and then wait some more. That's one of her quotes that she's known for, as well as to observe more and do less. So the more you can observe your child, the more information you're going to gain about what your child is interested in, about what they're physically capable of, about what developmental abilities and skills they're currently working toward and trying to master. The more you can observe without interfering, you're giving yourself the knowledge that you need to respond to your child in an appropriate fashion. So if we want to respect our children, even the youngest of babies, then we can use these powers of observation to our advantage to help us understand what our children are trying to communicate to us. So just as an example, this might look like with a young baby who's on the floor playing, let's say that they need a diaper change. Ordinarily, we would just go over and maybe scoop them up and say, time to change your diaper and take them over to the changing table. Not so in the Rye or Montessori approach. We would be a little bit more delicate about it and go over and look at the baby first and you know take that moment to connect and engage and then say, may I pick you up? and then wait, wait for the baby to give us a response of some kind before we go in and scoop them up. It might be just a look or a smile, maybe they'll hold their hands out to you if they're old enough to do that, but we do take that time to wait and allow them to give us their permission in their own way. And then observation is also about observing ourselves. 
looking inward, doing a bit of self-reflection and maybe re-examining our own childhood, how we were raised and how those things might be affecting our parenting in the here and now and actively thinking about the things that perhaps we want to change. This is not only a huge part of the Rye approach, but Dr. Montessori also spoke a lot about the preparation of the adult as being just as important, if not more important, than the preparation of the child's environment. Being able to do that self-reflection so that we can root out the skeletons in our closet, if you will, to be able to give the best version of ourselves to our children without judgment. Another similarity that you'll find is being sure to give the child time for uninterrupted play. In both Rye and Montessori, this is huge. We want to give the child all the time that they need. We want to respect their process, the need that they may have to repeat a task as many times as they might need to, and to not needlessly interrupt with comments and questions and trying to insert ourselves into their play and almost take over their play as opposed to just sitting back and observing. In both approaches, we really want to try to protect the child's concentration so that we can help to build their attention span over time. Another similarity between the two approaches is a carefully prepared, safe environment that really helps to promote the child's sense of security. This way they have the freedom to explore. So in both cases, you'll find low open shelving that is easily accessible to the child, um, fewer but well-selected toys, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Typically, natural lighting is preferred, um, muted colors, very minimal aesthetics for the most part, so as not to visually overstimulate the child. So you won't find much on the walls, maybe a few things here and there, and in a Montessori environment, it would be down low at the child's level, but very minimal. And then also ample space for movement. That freedom to move piece is very important in both cases. And speaking of freedom, another similarity between the two approaches is freedom within limits. Now, I don't believe it's explicitly called that in the Rye approach. That's what it's called in the Montessori approach, but the ideas are still the same. The child is offered freedom to explore and utilize their environment however they see fit, given that things are set up so that safety is a number one priority. And so typically what that looks like is that we're not only giving them opportunities for independence, but we're also giving them the freedom to move, which we've already discussed. We are giving them the freedom to repeat activities as many times as they need to, which we've already talked about. And we're also giving them the freedom to choose. We are offering them a limited amount of choices, again, freedom within limits, throughout their day to help them feel empowered. So we're allowing them to perhaps choose what they want to wear in the morning from maybe two different outfits, or they're choosing between the red cup and the blue cup at snack time or you know, they're choosing which bedtime story they want to have from a little basket that's in their room, what have you. We're giving them lots of these little small choices that are reasonable and age appropriate. Related to this idea is the next similarity, which is that children are viewed as active participants in their own caregiving routines, even as babies. Now in the Montessori community, this is typically called care of self activities. It's part of the practical life curriculum where children are taking responsibility for the care of their own bodies from as early as they are showing signs of readiness to do so. And in the Rye approach, it is quite similar, I think, which is why I've got it grouped together as a similarity here for you guys. I think that Rye does take it to another level, which is why I'm also gonna talk about it in the differences section. But for now, let's suffice it to say that both approaches view the child's participation in getting themselves dressed, in you know changing their diaper, in feeding themselves. All of those tasks are viewed as something that the child should be participating in. They should be doing it with the adult, in collaboration with the adult, as opposed to the adult just doing it to them constantly. So just as a quick example for you with getting dressed, even a baby can be a participant in this process. Instead of just placing the baby on a changing table and roughly shoving a onesie over their head and you know pulling their arms through the sleeves and making it this process that it almost feels like they're resisting a little bit. Instead, in both approaches, it's encouraged to take the time to slow down, to really go at your baby's pace whenever possible, to let them know what is happening, to talk to them as you're doing it. Okay, now we're gonna put the shirt over your head. Now I'm going to put your arm through this sleeve. Can, can you push your arm through the sleeve? And giving them that opportunity to actually 
help you a little bit by you know stretching out their arm so that it goes through the sleeve and then switching okay now we're going to do the other arm and really toning it down again we're going to talk about that in just a little bit when we get to the differences section but for now i think you guys get the idea another similarity between the two approaches is the importance of modeling so in both rye and montessori there is a lot of talk about the importance of being conscientious of your own behavior especially in front of your child you want to be sure that you are modeling the behavior that you want to see your child doing and so this means not only your interactions with other adults in front of your child but also your interactions with other children and also your interactions with the child him or herself i think the basic rules of thumb here are that first to remember your child is always learning from you at every single moment of the day in every interaction that you have and also that your child is going to do as you do and not as you say and the final similarity between montessori and rye is something that in the rye approach is referred to as selective intervention I don't know that it has a name really in Montessori, but again, the ideas are the same. You are trusting in the child's competence and their ability to be problem solvers. So you are not swooping in and solving all of the problems and conflicts for your child. Instead, you are taking a step back, you're being patient, you're waiting, you're observing, and then you're stepping in to offer them as much help as they need but as little as necessary, what Magda Gerber calls the smallest facilitating step. So essentially you are making a concerted effort to not interfere unless it is absolutely necessary. You're giving your child as much opportunity as they can possibly have to practice figuring things out on their own and not constantly seeking an adult to help solve the problem for them. So this might be in an individual situation where your child is maybe frustrated over something that's not quite going their way. Maybe they're you know, struggling to get their sock on their foot. Maybe they're working on a tower and the blocks keep falling over because it's not quite balanced. Maybe they've got you know, like two stacking cups that are stuck together and they can't get them apart and you know, they're getting frustrated you are selectively intervening at the right moment and not just jumping in and solving it for them. Or maybe they're having a conflict with another child, you know, two toddlers arguing over a toy, pulling it back and forth. No, it's mine, no, it's mine. You're not just gonna jump in and play the referee and say, well, he had it last, so now it's your turn. You're gonna give them a chance to actually try to resolve that conflict on their own. Unless they're hurting each other, you're gonna try to stay out of it as much as you can. And if you do decide to step in, that you're remembering to do so as neutrally as possible. Again, you're not the referee. You're just there to maintain the balance, to maintain safety while they figure it out amongst themselves. Okay, so those are all of the similarities that I could suss out based on my own understanding of the two approaches. And there were quite a lot of them, but there are also a couple of differences. And I think they're pretty important differences that we should talk about. And the first one has to do with the age focus for each of the different approaches. So the Rye approach really tends to focus on infants and toddlers. So from zero to three. However, the principles are most definitely applicable to older children, even teenagers and adults. And then on the other hand, Montessori, it was originally designed for three to six year olds, but over the years, it has been expanded to include the zero to three age group, as well as older children, all the way up through adolescence to adulthood. Another difference lies in one of the cornerstones of the Rye approach, and that is that a secure attachment is necessary for a child's proper development. Now, I feel like this could be implied with a lot of the things that are talked about in the you know real foundation concepts of Montessori too, but I feel like it's more explicitly called out in the Rye approach and there's a great emphasis on it. And so especially with regard to caregiving routines, in the Rye approach, caregiving routines like diapering, feeding, bathing a child, all of these are to be viewed as opportunities for connection, times to be together and to enjoy it, not as a chore that needs to be gotten through very quickly so that the child can get back to playing. And so there is an emphasis on slowing down, making sure that you are establishing that connection by smiling, looking into the child's eyes, talking to them about what you're doing as you're doing it together, asking for their cooperation, 
always being sure to use your gentle hands at all times. There's actually a really beautiful quote that I remember reading in my Rye Foundations course that I just, it has always stuck with me and I don't think I will ever forget it. And I have it on my phone. I wanna read it to you guys because it really impressed upon me the importance of this during caregiving routines. And the quote reads, hands constitute the infant's first connection with the world. Hands pick her up, lay her down, wash and dress her, and even feed her. What a different picture of the world an infant receives when quiet, patient, careful yet secure and resolute hands take care of her. And how different the world seems when these hands are impatient, rough or hasty, unquiet and nervous. In the beginning, hands are everything for an infant. The hands are the person the world. So I just, like I said, have never forgotten that quote. I hope you guys will find it as meaningful in helping to remember about slowing down during caregiving routines too. But I digress a little. So this is a really big emphasis in the Rye approach. Like I said, more so I think than is really expressly talked about in the Montessori approach, but is also inherently a part of it too. Related to this is another difference that I noticed, and that is in the Rye approach, outside of caregiving routines, there doesn't really seem to be much of a discussion of practical life work like there is in the Montessori approach, especially with regard to toddlers. So like I said, caregiving routines in Rye and what we call care of self activities in Montessori, I think those tend to overlap a little bit. Um, but outside of that, there really is no other discussion of the other kinds of practical life work that you might find in a Montessori environment for toddlers. And I think that's because in the Rye approach, there really is a focus on providing just a simple, open-ended space for children to explore and play with no agenda whatsoever, all the way up through the toddler years, all the way up till they're three and they're ready to go to preschool. Whereas in the Montessori approach, Practical life work, especially in the home setting, really does tend to get introduced in the toddler years. That is when they begin to become interested in helping out with practical life activities around the house, you know, like laundry, doing the dishes, sweeping, mopping, you know, washing windows, caring for pets and plants and things like that. That is when they become interested in it. And so you'll see that in a Montessori home quite often, and even to a degree in Montessori toddler classrooms. So it's not to say that I think there is a rejection of the idea of practical life work in the Rye approach, but from what I have gathered, it's more so of if your child is showing the interest, then of course there's no reason not to let them get involved, but it's not like a focus like it is in the Montessori approach. And while we're talking about the different kinds of activities that you'll find in a Montessori versus a Rye environment, let's talk about the actual materials that you'll find on the shelves in the play space. And so in a Rye environment, you'll find lots of open-ended materials or play objects as they refer to them as things that don't really have an express purpose and they can't be used in a particular way. They just can be used however the child feels inclined to use them. So you might find things like cotton scarf tents or metal bowls and colanders or um, a basket of differently shaped, colored and textured balls. You might find a baby doll with hair. You might find a little basket of plastic hair rollers or silicone muffin cups or um, pool inflatables like beach balls and pool rings that are like semi-deflated are also really popular. Wiffle balls are another really big one. Small metal condiment cups, as well as gross motor equipment. So the famous pickler triangle that so many of you guys have probably seen, that's actually a rye piece of equipment, not Montessori, even though you also find it in Montessori spaces as well, more commonly these days. Um, also ramps and risers, play cubes for the children to crawl in and out of. Of. You might find a balance board or in the outdoor play area, you'll find you know things for water play or sand play. Basically anything that allows the child to move freely and to use it however they want to use it where an adult doesn't have to say, no, don't do it like that. They can do whatever they want with it. Those are the kinds of materials that you'll find in a Rye environment. Whereas in a Montessori environment, you are more apt to find closed ended activities that have a purpose, that give a child an opportunity to master a particular sequence of steps. 
And so those two things are very different. Now in a Montessori home setting, you will also find open-ended materials and that's fairly normal because it's a home environment. But in a Montessori classroom, for example, you're not going to find any kinds of open-ended materials. Typically you'll find things that again, have a very express purpose. So a puzzle that needs to be put together, a basket of language materials with some cards for matching. You might find an object permanence box or an infant coin box with coins to post inside, or maybe a tray that's set up for threading or for sewing or for practical life work where they're pouring dry beans from one pitcher to another. There are, again, a sequence of steps involved for the child to do and within reason at times depending on the environment the child may be able to use these materials in other creative ways as well but at the end of the day there is a specific purpose to the activity and then i also found it really interesting that in the rye approach it's actually suggested to not give mirrors or mobiles to infants whereas in the montessori approach there's an entire series of mobiles designed specifically for infants and a mirror horizontally placed along the floor in the infant's movement area is like a cornerstone of setting up that space for an infant. And in the Rye approach, the reasoning for no mirror is that it is confusing for a child who doesn't understand that it's a reflection. They reach out thinking they're about to touch another baby and instead hit a cold, hard surface. And so it might be a little disconcerting and confusing for them. And then the reason for not using mobiles with infants in the Rye approach is twofold. One, it is considered artificial stimulation. So we're not allowing the child to choose it for themselves. It's not natural. It's being placed into their environment by the adult. And again, might not be something that they would choose on their own if they had the ability to choose. But also because it is viewed as something that might be overstimulating for the child if they're not quite ready for it. Maybe the mobile is too close to their face and they just can't see anything except the mobile, you know? So. Very interesting differences there. Another difference related to the environmental details is in the use of natural materials versus plastic. So in the Montessori approach, the preference is definitely for natural materials. So, you know, wood, cotton, silk, metal, ceramic, glass, things like that. And for the most part, plastic is to be avoided when possible. Although we recognize that in modern day, it's almost impossible to get away from it completely, but as much as you can. Whereas in a rye environment, although natural materials are appreciated, plastic is just as acceptable to have. So a lot of the play objects that you'll find in a baby's play environment do incorporate plastic or are 100% made of plastic and that's not really a big deal. Another environmental difference between Montessori and rye is in the use of gates. So I think it's fairly safe to say that in a Montessori environment, gates are not quite as common. You might see them used where a direct safety risk is involved, like for example, at a stairway to make sure that the child does not have unsupervised access to the stairs before they're developmentally ready to tackle that. Um, or maybe they have a small gate at their bedroom for the purposes of keeping them safe in the nighttime if they have learned to open and close their door by themselves or maybe you have a large pet running around your house that you're afraid is going to step on the baby when they're you know, having some independent playtime, and so you might gate off a room or an area to make sure that the animal doesn't have access to the baby in that way. But for the most part, Montessori families really want their children to have free exploration of their home. They want their children to be able to join them in the kitchen or to go into and out of the bathroom as necessary, especially when they're starting the toilet training process. And even before that, when they're trying to create toileting awareness. And so by gating off the child's access to the bathroom and the kitchen and other places that might be otherwise deemed as unsafe for the child, they're really restricting their movement to those areas of the house. And so I think Montessori families for the most part try to shy away from using lots of different gates. With that said, safety is still a number one priority. So I think that the strategy more commonly employed in a Montessori setting is to try to baby proof various areas of your home as much as possible so that it is safe for your child to explore to the degree that you're willing to let them explore. So maybe leaving one or two of your kitchen cabinets unlocked with safe things in it, but then adding locks to the other ones. This way they can still come and go in the kitchen 
kitchen without needing to worry about them getting injured. Or maybe installing a lock on the toilet seat, you know, if you feel worried about them accidentally falling into the toilet if they happen to be in the bathroom, things like that. But otherwise, like I said, giving them that freedom to explore most of the home. Now, I think this is in stark contrast to the Rye approach where gates are commonly used and quite accepted. And it's actually encouraged to start using gates from as early as possible. This way, the child always sees them as a fixture in their environment. And it's not something that they object to as they get older. It's just what has always been in their environment and it's something that they're used to. In the Rye approach, gates are used not only to cordon off areas of the environment that may not be safe for the child, but they're also used to create a very clearly defined area that is designed specifically for the child that has been 100% baby proofed that they are free to explore, which is often called a yes space. And I think the name kind of implies what it's for. It's supposed to be an area where you don't have to tell your child, no, don't do that. It is designed just for them. They can touch and climb and do whatever they want in that space safely, you know they'll be safe doing it, and you can have that peace of mind. Another key difference between the two approaches is in the sleeping arrangements for infants and toddlers. So in the Rye approach, the traditional crib is used, and in the Montessori approach, it is encouraged to use a floor bed. So some Montessori families will start out their newborns in a bassinet or a Moses basket, or maybe even in a crib, depending on what they feel comfortable with doing. But eventually they do transition to a floor bed at some point. And the idea behind using the floor bed is that the child has the ability to get in and out of their bed of their own volition. They have that freedom to explore if they're not quite tired yet and then to listen to their own body's cues and return to their bed when they actually are tired and ready for sleep. They also don't have the confines of the bars on the outside of the crib to obscure their clear view of the environment and they also don't have to rely on an adult to come get them when they're ready to get up. They can just get out of the bed and if they have the ability to exit the room then they can do that and go join the family but otherwise they do have that freedom to move. I would like to point out though that there are definitely some Montessori families who still use a traditional crib for their infants and I think it really just comes down to personal preference. And the final difference between the two approaches that I would like to share in today's video is with regard to the eating approach. So across the board in both approaches, there's actually a little bit of overlap because the child is not forced to eat anything against their will. I think it's pretty well agreed upon and on both sides that the role of the adult is simply to decide what the child is going to eat. They're in charge of providing healthy options at mealtimes and also making sure that they are providing regularly scheduled meals. So deciding when the child is going to eat. Whereas the child's responsibility is to decide A, if they're going to eat at all, whether or not they're hungry, listening to their own bodies, they're going to decide what they want to eat out of what has been provided to them. So they may choose to eat some of it or all of it, or maybe none of it. And they're going to decide how much of each of the things that they've chosen that they want to eat. They decide when they're full, again, listening to their own body's cues. So those are the same ideas, I think, both in Montessori and in Rye. But what's different is the actual physical location for mealtimes. So in the Montessori approach, a child does not use a high chair. That's actually the same as Rye as well. Um, there is no high chair. They are actually seated at a small weaning table from the time that they are able to sit upright by themselves. So a weaning table is just a very small child-sized table that is low enough to the ground that when they sit in their own small child-sized chair, their feet can touch the ground and the table is at an appropriate height for them. And that is where they sit to have their meals. And then the adult sits kind of like, you know, on the other side of the table facing them and sits with them during their meal times, not only for safety and supervision, but also for establishing that social aspect of meal times. Now in the Rye approach, meal times for infants actually happen on the parent or caregiver's lap. So they're seating the child on their lap and really getting close and engaging with them during their meal time, whether they're spoon feeding them or allowing them to, you know, do baby led weaning style, choosing food that way, that, you know, however they choose to do it, they're still on their parent or caregiver's lap for the entire meal. And then as they transition to toddlerhood, when they're able to get in and out of a chair and a table 
100% by themselves, then they transition to sitting at their own small table. So a little bit of a difference there between the two of those approaches. All right, friends. So those are most of the major similarities and differences between the Rye approach and the Montessori approach. Before I close out this video, I want to share with you a couple of quotes from both Magda Gerber and Dr. Marie Montessori. I think that these two quotes in particular really highlight the similarities that both of these incredible women had in their thinking of how they approached the child and the way they viewed the child with just the utmost respect for all that they were capable of. You know, you have these two very different approaches, again, with a lot of overlap, but still very different, but yet they were really after the same thing at the end of the day. So I'm gonna start off first with a quote from Magda Gerber and it reads, it's important to see your child as a whole person and to help the whole person develop. Motor development and cognitive growth are only parts of the whole. There is also your child's unique personality to consider. Help your child reach her potential by seeing her as a confident, problem-solving person. And this quote is in Magda Gerber's book, Your Self-Confident Baby, which is a book that I would definitely recommend reading if you are interested in learning more about applying the Rye approach at home with your infant or toddler. And now the other quote from Dr. Montessori, which reads, a child has a body which grows and a mind which develops. Both his physiological and psychic development have a single source, life. We should not corrupt or suffocate his mysterious potentialities but wait for their successive manifestations. And that is from her book, The Discovery of the Child, which again is a great read for anybody who really wants to dig into the nitty gritty of Montessori philosophy. All right, so I think that just about wraps it up for today's video. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to share those in the comments down below. If you are interested in learning more about Montessori at home, I offer a couple of e-courses that walk you through it step by step. I also just came out with my very first book called The Montessori Home, Create a Space for Your Child to Thrive. So I will leave links to all of those things in the description box down below for you to check out. And just in case you are new to my channel, I also wanted to let you know that this video is part of a much larger series on this YouTube channel called Montessori at Home, which is aimed at providing practical tips and advice for busy parents like you and I for implementing Montessori at home with our children. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in watching more of, then you might consider subscribing to my channel. This way you don't miss a new video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.